Good. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing? They should make a vacuum for sinuses. <laughs> they do. No, don't tell me that. I have that. a whole That's... story about that. No, uh, I don't want to hear. Mm, of course. I think you need to hear the story. It's really fun. No, no, nobody needs to hear that story. <laughs> Wait, what did I miss? What did no, I just come into? No, Rosie, just mm, no, you no, you don't, no. interest. What's going on? <laughs> so my middle, my little sister, who's not really uh, related to me, but uh, I've known her since she was born, and I treat her like my little sister. She she's uh, severely mentally handicapped. She was born with her umbilical cord around her neck, and uh -huh. she went like three and a half minutes without oxygen. So she she's probably I think she's forty six now and probably have the mentality of about a six-year-old poor little girl mm -hmm. but uh she couldn't do a lot of things that normal kids could do uh like clear nostrils and stuff like that so they gave her one of these little things like you use for babies i didn't know what it was and i found it i was like five and i stuck it in my mouth and squeezed it ah! oh no <laughs> why 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 what oh. is that any conclusion <laughs> that is too funny yeah, so yeah. awful I, I've, I've stopped well now i want to say i'd stop putting things in my mouth and experimenting with them but i haven't I mean, I've still put things right in my mouth. see you just had to know rosie <laughs> i mean really did you have to ask it made my morning a lot better so I no. mean... <laughs> <laughs> well i'm so proud my oldest daughter was at a pet stop or pet whatever that bigger pet chain is uh <laughs> she but... not looking i had to lick it <laughs> but <laughs> Come on now. I was like, that's awesome. It's that's my feel, baby. <laughs> oh my God. I've been feeling miserable all week, and then you just decide to throw that up there. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, it's, it's never been, you know, drank weeks, weeks old snot before. Uh, oh stop. That's another person. Oh man. Mm. You got some issues you really need to address. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Hey, this is how I became the man that you see before you. Oh, God. <laughs> I mean, it's an interesting person I see before me. <laughs> so. The coolest thing was when I found, I didn't have any idea what it was. I could tell it was some kind of lever mechanism because it looked like a handle. But I was too small to really figure out what it was. And it was a, a heavy duty stapler. Oh, oh my God. Reason I couldn't squeeze it. Then finally, I stuck it against my stomach, squeezed it like that, stapled my shirt to my stomach. Oh, oh. <laughs> I was like, ah! <laughs> Took off running. <laughs> oh my gosh. This is too much. This is, it's and then, so of course, weird. there's the whole peeing in the light socket thing. That was. Okay, uh, okay. That, that, that's, you uh, have a lot of interesting stories. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I was a really a weird kid. I did a lot of, did a lot of neat <laughs> things. Got yes. caught peeing out the upstairs bathroom window. You sandwich is shy of a picnic. Caught by the principal slash pastor. The pastor happened to be the guy that buried my dad and mom. Uh huh. But he was the principal of our school, and he also was a pastor. He's also the chaplain uh, for the police force in Portsmouth. Oh my and gosh! I had, to, I guess, as a boy, sometimes boys had this thing about peeing, and I was standing up in the windowsill, and they had those windows that you know opened up like that, yeah. and I was peeing out, and I looked down, and there's Pastor Hunter. Billy, I see you. Get down to my office. Oh God. <laughs> Uh, and that was the same bathroom I, I dared my friend David Fult to urinate in. He wouldn't do it. And I was like, well, somebody's got to do it because I'm really curious about what's going to happen now. So I dropped trial and saw a blue flame flying uh. up inside of me. And, <laughs> it was awful. Uh. I do not recommend that for anybody. Yep. <sighs> so. So that's the excitement for your Monday morning, everybody. How how how's how was your weekend? Now that we're all awake and coherent with <laughs> these lovely stories, my weekend was pretty okay. I went up to um, a cabin uh, by the James River this weekend for a friend's party, and oh cool. We spent like three days up there. I've got some really nice pictures and stuff. Awesome, that does yeah. sound fun. You didn't happen to look for any Jeffersonian shells, did you? Oh, no, I didn't. But I mean, we did get this really good opportunity to do some stargazing. And I immediately found uh, uh, the Big Dipper, like right there in the sky. It's huge, isn't it? <laughs> it's huge when you can see the whole thing. I remember finding it when I was a kid. And I don't remember it being so awestruckingly big. But later on, when I learned that it was the Big Dipper and Ursa Major and uh, the Little Dipper, I was like, wow. 
Yeah, no, when it's you really can see, big. when you can see the whole thing, like there's no trees, no clouds, nothing yeah, in the sky. It's you it's huge. It's, it's it's pretty awesome when you do that down There's there. a really good galaxy in it too, you can catch if you have even a, a you know, a four inch telescope like you get from Walmart or something. If you know where to look, there's I think it's M one oh one that's in there, it's pretty awesome. I got to see that with a with a uh, supernova in it, but I got to see it with our twenty inch telescope. It was really awesome. That's awesome. And uh, actually, yeah, being in the mountain area or near lakes where it's you know nice and dark, man, you would not believe how much prettier the sky is. Were you able to see the Milky Way? No, it unfortunately wasn't that dark um, yeah. because this was like the sun had literally just set like ten minutes ago. Oh yeah. Yeah, and uh, uh, Ursa Major is actually one of the biggest constellations. I think it's like the second or third largest constellation in the night sky, so that is pretty big. Well, today we're covering Chapter 19, which is on galaxies, and I've had a little intro to you guys knowing some of the gross, terrible things that happened in my life. Uh, we, <laughs> I've got lots more where those came from. You know, I used to ride bikes, what they call X Games stuff now. That was what I did all through high school. Uh, rather than, you know, those unprofitable sports like football and baseball and basketball uh, and tennis, uh, I was into riding my bike and riding half pipes and quarter pipes and street and stuff like that. I wasn't ever much into racing. I was always into jumps and uh, things like that. So I got a, cool, a lot of cool injury stories I can tell you about, you know, putting braces through my lip and the first time I dropped in and the second time I dropped in and the third time I dropped in on a... <laughs> until finally I got good at dropping in. So anyways, uh, those stories will come at later times, I guess. <laughs> I should make a whole nother YouTube channel just for my idiot stories. But anyways, uh, so let's get started on chapter 19 if no one has any questions. We had a test due. I, I think I saw that only three students missed it, so that's good. Uh, we got another one that'll be coming due. Probably I'll open it Thursday. I've already opened the practice test. Uh, I think this last one was what... Uh, 16 and 7 no 15 and 16 yeah 15 and 16 because the next one's going to be 17 and 18 and uh we just finished 18 last week so all right well let's go ahead and get started i'm going to share my screen question somebody did have a question i'm sorry i missed yeah you. Just... yeah um so on the test i keep seeing like these questions about like the like set diagram seven one like you know oh that's not that. good and i don't understand them like at all like they i don't see that covered in the book or anything yeah, is, diagram... the photograph, is the photograph in it at least <laughs> yeah so yeah. the diagram's there but it's always like it's always diagram seven dash one and and it's always asking like the it's what? always asking a variety of different yeah, questions yeah. like which yeah. tradition... one was the atomics uh like a nucleus and got little arrows and yeah arcs. yeah, yeah. Okay. none of them make sense to me because it's not in the book i i look yeah the it sort of is but it was way back in an earlier chapter let me stop sharing and, and turn on my document cam <laughs> so you can understand what's going on with that it's really not as hard as you think uh or as it seems so what the deal is is you have a nucleus something like this right and then outside the nucleus, you have a first orbital. And then the second orbital is considerably further away from the first. And then the third is considerably closer. And the fourth is closer still. And maybe even a fifth. Okay. And you can have arrows and your arrows might be up or down. So I'm going to draw them right now without the up or down arrow just to Okay, so right now, if the arrow's up or if the arrow's down, that's one question I can ask you. Okay, let's let's assume for a second that the arrow is down, so I'll go ahead and draw it and commit. Okay, so one question I can ask you, is the diagram above a uh, diagram uh, showing an emission spectra or showing an absorption spectra? Absorption. And uh, this one's actually an emission spectra. Yeah, okay. Okay. And here's the problem. Uh, basically, what you have is these are electrons falling down. So electrons are going from high energy, like they're on top of a telephone pole, falling down to on top of a, you know, maybe a box, <laughs> okay, because it's not quite to the ground. 
obviously the ground will be the nucleus level, but there is no access to any lower level. So that's one thing I want to point out to you. Really, the whole idea of the Bohr model of the atom, what you cover in chemistry, physics, and biology, is that there are certain allowed orbitals in which electrons can occupy, and there's limited numbers to each of those orbitals, and those are the only states they can be in. They can't be anywhere in between. So they're only allowed at this radius, this radius, this radius, this radius, this radius, this radius. And that's it, right? Oh. So when the electron falls from this high energy state to this low energy state, that's a decrease in energy. So you can only uh, con conserve energy by creating a, a photon that takes that energy away. Hence, a photon is emitted. Right. So arrows in reverse would be an absorption. An absorption. Exactly. If it's if it's going up, it's an absorption spectrum because the only way an electron can jump from a low level to a high level is by a photon disappearing. Well, one of the ways is by a photon disappearing and the electron jumping up. So that's one typical question. So when the arrow is down, that implies an emission spectra. So the question that the questions that I'm like confused about, um, uh -huh. I, I think I get the like whether it's emission or absorption part. Right. But the ones that like I don't understand at all are the ones that are like the following types of photons are absorbed blue, red, yellow, infrared, x ray. Right. Which of the transitions would absorb the infrared one? Right. And so I, that's the next thing I'm going to do. <laughs> so uh, what you do is now, now that you have that settled question, of course. I can give you any number, in this case, five uh, different uh, photons and ask you which one came from which, or I could ask you which is the most energetic or which is the least energetic or which is the highest frequency or which is the lowest frequency or which is the highest temp, uh, well, I shouldn't say temperature, uh, which is the largest wavelength, which is the shortest wavelength. All those are questions I can ask you. And I can ask you uh, which one is one, which one is two, which one is three, which one is four, which one is five. See the numbering system I have? Which yeah. one is four and which one's three? Right. Yeah. I can ask you all. Oh, shit. Hold on. Thank you. Nice catch. I was like, what in the world's going on with that? I thing? forgot I had drawn this one already. I want to go to that one. So this is five. Hey, I already confused. No, that's another one. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> You I remember I started on the wrong spot. That's what it was. Okay, so I want to go from, yeah, this from here to here will be five and five. <laughs> yeah, that's not repeated. Okay, so five. The, the important thing to remember is remember this one's going to be slightly longer than that one because that each paper. of the ones gets a little closer together. Put that paper more to the center where your hand's at. Because for us, it's like at the top right of the screen, which is very hard to see. Uh-huh. What about it now? Scoot your paper down. Scooch it down. There we go. Really? Because I'm seeing like all the way. Yes, but it's gotcha. it's weird for the visual people. Okay, we have gotcha. to look at it, not you. Got you. Okay, so so here's the deal. In order to do this question, you have to know the electromagnetic spectrum, and the electromagnetic spectrum is great excess undermines various industries. Marxism rules. And then I uh, break out the visual spectrum, which is normally Roy G. Bibb, but in this order that I've made up with this mnemonic, it's Bibb Gior. So the first thing you want to do is label on here what photons I've given you. So let's say the following photons. And normally my question will say emitted were emitted or absorbed because I don't give away the answer to the previous question. The following photons were emitted slash absorbed. And I would say uh, x-ray. I would say microwave. I would say orange. Uh, let's say infrared and UV, ultraviolet. Okay. That's what's the blue and red. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, the big thing is all you have to do is now one, two, three, four, five. Now, yeah, all you have to do is go and mark these. 
So now I'm going to take my pen and say, okay, well, there's clearly an x-ray. There's clearly a micro. There's clearly an orange, an infrared, and a UV. Okay. Then you just have to know what orders what. Okay. Gamma rays, remember, are small wavelength. They're also uh, high frequency, high energy. And of course, you normally remember high temperature, even though that's not really not relevant to these types of questions. And these, of course, are long wavelength, low frequency, low energy, and low T. <laughs> okay. So what this means is x-ray is the highest energy one. And what you realize, and this is the key to understanding this whole diagram, the length of the arrow literally means, hey, if you want to find this energy, you take the energy of this one and you subtract from it the energy of this one and you set that equal to HF and that gives you the frequency. But that also, that subtraction also gives you the energy. So the longest arrow is the largest energy. So here's another rule. Longest implies largest energy. So now you have to say, okay, well, the highest energy one was x-rays. So that must be one. So I'll put one here. The second highest energy is number two. Uh, that's furthest to the left after the x-ray. So that must be number two. The next highest is orange. So that must be number three. The next highest is infrared. So that must be number, uh, actually number five is bigger than, or number five is bigger than number four. So I should put five there. That's the one thing you gotta be careful about. And that's why I had to try to do that because there is one arrow that's sort of a different order. And I wanted to make sure y'all knew that. Uh, and then this is four, okay? So remember the longer the arrow, the larger the energy. If I ask you a question about frequency, well, you just say, well, high energy is the same thing as high frequency. So you just answer it from the same way you would do energy. If I ask you the wavelength though, longest wavelength, you'd have to start at this side. And in that case, the uh, shortest arrow is the longest wavelength. Okay, so those are your real rules, and that, that's it. That's all you have to do, and all the questions are built basically on that idea. You have to know basically uh, that the length of the arrow is directly related to the energy, and then you need to know, of course, how energy is related to wavelength. The reason why we say they're inversely related is E is equal to HF, but remember, V is equal to F times lambda, so this can also be written as HC over lambda, in which case you see E uh, and lambda are thumbs up, thumbs down. Whereas E and frequency are thumbs up, thumbs up because E and F, E and F. Okay. <clears throat> oh, got to see trying to come in. Um, yeah, I definitely understand it a lot better now. Um, on the test, there were also quite a few questions that were right on the practice test uh -huh. and like, but then they were marked wrong on the line on the exam. <laughs> okay. One thing about that, there's, <clears throat> I use the same bank. So it's very unlikely if they have a different, an for them to have a different answer in the banks than they do in the actual test. Uh, mm -hmm. But what it does change is literally sometimes I'll have one little word different. And they'll look like identical questions, but you'll just admit the fact that one word was different and that one word makes the whole different, uh, the answer entirely different. But I will, uh, what's your, what's your name? Uh, Melvin. Hey, Melvin. I, I will check over yours, Melvin. If you tell me specifically what numbers, uh, go ahead and email me. Let me know uh, any place where you think that happened and I'll look them over just to make sure uh, I'm not in error. 
But generally speaking, like I said, I, I literally use the exact same bank, so they shouldn't have different qu uh, answers from one uh, version of the test to another. Okay. But I, I will check and see because sometimes there are some where I've made I've I found an error in the bank and I made the change and say one bank but didn't make it in the other or something stupid like that. So there's a possibility, but very unlikely. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Anybody else? Does that, does that help everyone understand that question? We have, I've, I've actually done this several times on past videos uh, uh, during class as well, not, not just videos that I posted. Uh, this is one of the, what I consider bread and butter uh, astrophysics type questions. This is, this is the fundamental understanding of how we know so much stuff. You know, when I tell you that our sun uh, exactly replicates the matter that was in existence of our nebula when the star when our solar system was made and therefore matches the elements that are present that's all known because of this type of stuff so that's why i consider it super important that's the whole knowledge of uh spectra that that makes everything uh make sense to us in astronomy so that's how we know for instance uh the sun is about 75 percent hydrogen and 25 percent helium that sort of thing any other questions on this? <clears throat> any other questions on any other type of material? Uh, what's making me think about Melvin's uh, issue? Melvin, what if is there any chance the questions you thought might have been different were ones about stars being above the eastern horizon at such and such a time? Um, no. Um, okay. For example, I'm looking at it right now, and it's a protostar is... And so on the practice test, it's in hydrostatic equilibrium as it collapses. And then during the test, I put, you know, I put that answer, but this on the, like on the test, it has five options. It's in. I'll last. go ahead and share screen with me right quick. Let me see what I can make out of it right now. Um, and this will help everybody. I just made it where you can share the screen. Oh, cool, cool. I have to agree with him. I had trouble with that. That's why so this is number 14 on the test gotcha and then this was oh sorry this was on the practice test which i got right and hydrostatic equilibrium as it collapses and let me see the other one. Oh wow that is yeah i i did the same thing are the exact same options there except Not that one has a fifth one yeah ah gotcha uh, let's look at the other one again. I, gotcha. Is uh, far out of hydrostatic equilibrium when it collapses, heated to millions of degrees as it collapses. Flat uh, flat into disc as it collapses. Yeah. And then the other one, let me see one more time, Melvin. Sorry. Uh, in hydrostatic equilibrium, not in hydrostatic equilibrium as it collapses, uh, heated to millions of degrees as it collapses. That one, sh I think, is the correct one. Flattened into a disk as it collapses and powered by chemical reactions. I think both of them are wrong with hydrostatic. E I mean, hydrostatic equilibrium is pressure in equals pressure out. And nothing collapses when it's in hydrostatic equilibrium. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm thinking that that's part of the problem. But yeah, I will definitely check that out. That then you're definitely right. That's definitely two questions. Now, the only thing is it does have a, a different answer for yeah. one of the choices. So, I, and, but I really doubt that's the right answer. So if that was a better answer, that would be, those two questions would be completely fair. I have to think about it a little bit to be sure, but you understand what I'm saying about that, Melvin? If, if yeah. that fifth choice that it gave you was better than the other one, then that's a, a fair multiple choice because it's not always the right answer. It's the best answer. Gotcha. So, and, and I would see uh, if I can make an argument for a chemical reaction being uh, relevant, which I can't for, for a protostar, I would see that question as being better just from the standpoint of something collapsing is sort of the antithesis of a hydrostatic equilibrium. So let me, yeah, I'll check that out for you and we'll get back with you. Thank okay. you. Thank you. And that's the same thing with you, Autumn, and everybody. Yeah, I, I had a weird, because I was going to put hydrostatic, but then I was just like, no. So I... I chose flattened to, to a disc as it collapses because I got it wrong even on the second second right. test. And I was just like, well, what the hell's going on with this question? The, the, 
the nebula cloud flattens to a disk, but not the yeah. star. So yeah, it's weird. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll look into that, and see what's going on, and I'll the probably book, either send you an email or, or update you in class next time. The book kind of made it sound like that's you know. So Reasonable. it said it said um, it should be in hydrostatic equilibrium like as it collapses so i was like oh okay oh, okay so yeah they're, they're uh -huh. talking about yeah that's sort of a quasi-static situation yeah uh, i will refresh myself on that material too because uh to be honest with you the part of astronomy that I, I know really the least about is those hydrostatic situations with uh uh star birth which would be proto stars as well as uh post life so when they start to go through the uh asymptotic giant branch and that kind of stuff that's the intent uh the details of astrophysics that i'm least familiar with uh yeah i've had a you know a couple courses that are related to it but not uh i just it's not a, something that i'm deeply embedded in experience wise so i will check that out and let you guys know i also had another question regarding the test go for it and which is always bugs me um there was, it doesn't matter if it's question 22, the places, the evolutionary stages showing the figure below in order from earliest to last, and they are basically a sun, you know. Oh, right, yeah. Going, those are really hard to read. Especially about. in the black and white. I thought I'd gotten rid of those. That was my intent was to get rid of most of those because the figures are so hard to tell one from the other. Yeah, and I had a hard time with that and... <laughs> Got it wrong both times, but <laughs> I <laughs> mean, me, yeah. Let me think about that. If if a lot of students got those, I might actually, I might actually uh, can't give everybody full credit when they get that question. Because that was a but pain in the ass. Question, to but look I, at. I'll check those out. All right. All right. Let me make a note for myself so I don't forget. Uh, check. Uh, Hydrostatic star. stars and photo stars. Hydrostatic. Thank you. And uh, equilibrium, no, uh, evolution. Evolution. Okay, yeah, I'll check those out. Thank you. All right, so let's jump into chapter 19 again. Anybody else have any questions, other questions before I get started? Going once. Going, going twice. once, going twice. <laughs> I'm thinking of Napoleon Dynamite. Classic, excellent movie. Okay, so here we go. So this is chapter 19, and we're talking about galaxies now. And, and it's kind of interesting when we start talking about galaxies, uh, because most people don't realize, you know, we didn't really know we were in, a, uh, in an actual galaxy and that there were, in fact, hundreds of billions of galaxies in our uh, observable universe until literally the 1900s. So this was literally... Hubble that put this together, Edwin Hubble, the astronomer, not the telescope, of course, uh, but the, the, the reason the telescope's name what it is, uh, he was the person that put it together that we were actually in an island of stars and there were actually tons and tons of islands of stars. And prior to that, and I want to say this was 19, I want to say this is around 19, somewhere between 1910 and 1920, but I'm leaning towards 1915 was when, when he did it, but your book will tell you, I just forgot the date. Was it like uh, the Great Debate or something? Yeah, well, yeah, that was the Harlow, Shapley, uh, and uh, damn it, I forgot the other guy's name. But yeah, that was the Great Debate. And and they they were actually trying to figure out whether that was a real thing or not. And But that was before Hubble had actually come up with the data. Because once Hubble uh, brings in his Andromeda galaxy, those two guys have to shut up. They can't make any comments anymore because basically it, it completely... Uh, subsided or, or, or settled the debate and if i remember correctly it was uh the younger one that ended up being on the right side of history there uh shapley and dang it i'll give it to i remember his name right in the middle of something so you'll hear me in a tourette type fashion holler out something random during class so that'll probably be why so the learning goals are determine a galaxy's type from its appearance and describe the motions of its stars Learning goal two is explain the distance ladder and how distances to galaxies are measured. Learning goal three is describe the evidence suggesting that galaxies are composed mostly of dark matter. Now that's kind of crazy. And learning goal four, discuss the evidence indicating that most, perhaps all large galaxies have supermassive black holes at its center. This is the Bard Spiral NGC 
1300 is the very first photo we run into. And that's when I was actually in the process of looking up uh, before class rudely started at its prompt time like it's unsupposed to. So this is a really cool typical barred spiral. So you see here, uh, and instead of just having a, a spiral uh, nebula, if you are a, a spiral a nucleus, if you will, it's got a bar going through it and then the spiral arms slide off of it. And it looks like it's rotating in a uh, clockwise fashion. And in fact, it is. Only it's kind of a weird thing in that there's more of a pressure or density wave that's really going from one area to the next around this way. And each time that pressure density wave comes flying through, it, it can hit uh, cold, densely packed molecular clouds and generate star formation. And then that makes that particular arm go from a dark cloud like this to a bright white arm like this. And the reason why it's that way is remember these bright uh, white and blue stars are B, O and B stars. They're super hot, but they're also super hot because they're super massive and such stars don't live very long. Ergo, they're transient, right? So what you're seeing is the last generation of star creation and then a gap where there's no star creation, then boom, another gap of star creation. So this is NGC 1300. It's a, it's a beautiful uh, st uh, spiral barred galaxy, excuse me, a, a spiral barred galaxy. And if you look in this picture, anything you see without a plus on it like that is another galaxy. Now, if it's so small that you can't tell if it's got a plus or not, it could be either one. But all these things that you see, this little dot over here, this little thing over here, uh, these little things, maybe that thing. I think that's actually something from the where they've altered the photo. Uh, this thing right here, all, the, all these things are actually distant galaxies. Isn't that amazing? That's a star, obviously. Uh, this one's a galaxy. So all these things, when you take photos like this deep field, uh, you're actually seeing really, really deep into the outer space, seeing very far back in history, in fact, and you're seeing galaxies. Uh, that's how we know, for instance, that there are 100 billion galaxies roughly in our observable universe. Uh, because you can take an area like this, count the number of galaxies, and ideally what you want to do is choose the, the blackest part of the sky like Hubble Deep Field did. Look at that area, a very small area in fact, and leave the, the aperture of the camera open for a long period of time. And then take that, uh, that picture and count all the galaxies in it and then say, well, how many of those, you know, small disks, i.e. how big is the photo in angular measure, how many of those does it take to completely surround you with a sphere of those photographs? Well, that multiplied by the number of galaxies you see in each one of those photos is the number of galaxies that are visible in our observable universe. So that, that's how they get estimates like 100 billion. Whereas, you know, the, the velocity curves is how they get the estimates of the stars in our galaxy. This is another beautiful uh, spiral galaxy here. This one's not a barred spiral. It's a, it's a really pretty uh, one that you see often. Uh, I, I want to say it's the Whirlpool Galaxy, but it might not be because it looks a little different to me than the Whirlpool Galaxy. Uh, in fact, this one is the... Is there like twin something? It starts with a T. Yeah, it could be. I'm actually trying. There it is, 19A Spiral Galaxy. No, they didn't give us a name on this one, buttholes. So yeah, that, that is actually figure 19. No, that's not. Yeah, it's figure 198 is what we're looking at uh, from your textbook, but it doesn't give me a name of that one either. Uh, so it's like with the T, it's like a, it's something that you twirl. It's like those twin or not twin but like yeah so uh, top hat the... or uh whirlpool was the one i was remembering but that that looks a little different than the whirlpool galaxy yeah I... oh it might have been uh was it triangulum uh, not, galaxy... tri not triangulum it's uh, like uh, it's like those little fan things that spin to the wind i forgot what they're called but they oh okay the yeah uh twin turbines <laughs> <laughs> that's pinwheel. Really good one. pinwheel pinwheel <laughs> that one yeah pinwheel, pinwheel. Pinwheel. yeah that's there yeah. you go. don't you hate it when you get the wrong letter in your mind yeah, yeah that clearly starts with a t <laughs> i do that yeah. all the time. that so yeah it, that could be the pinwheel because it does look just it's like the perfect image of a of a, 
uh, spiral galaxy anyways. So uh, a galaxy is a gravitationally bound collection of dust and gas. It's a million uh, to hundreds of billions of stars. For instance, Andromeda, we think it's another spar spiral galaxy. That's the nearest to us. That's 2.5 million light years away. Uh, they are very, very far away, but they're not as far away compared to their size as you might think. So they're a little more densely populating the of space than are, for instance, planets and stars in, inside of a galaxy. So that's kind of crazy. Uh, a galaxy like the Milky Way contains about 100 billion stars, and there are hundreds of billions of galaxies in the universe. And in this chapter, we're going to learn a little bit about how to classify those. And by the way, uh, you guys can look this up yourself. It's called Galaxy Zoo. I've written this on the little piece of paper that I will post as the notes for this uh, particular lecture, even though there's not going to be much on it. But Galaxy Zoo is a website you can go to. And some astronomers got the really bright idea that they would crowdsource. And the reason why is there's 100 billion stars in our galaxy. Uh, or excuse me, there's 100 billion galaxies in our observable universe. There's also 100 billion stars in our galaxy, but that's not really relevant here. Uh, but uh, there's about seven and a half billion people on planet Earth. And it turns out that computers are really crappy at classifying galaxies because they're, they're sort of like, you know, those uh, you are not a robot proof things they ask you to do. So we can look at photos and, and recognize an obscure car over in the top right hand corner. Uh, computers can't do that very well. So really the only way to classify these tons and tons and tons of photos of galaxies is to get humans to do it. Ergo, there came the idea of Galaxy Zoo. So uh, I think it was some people at UC Santa Barbara or UC uh, Berkeley, I can't remember which, but uh, they actually had the idea of, hey, let's crowdsource this. What we're going to do is we'll put all these photos online as soon as we process them, put them online. We'll create a little tutorial of teaching people how to classify galaxies. And then we'll have a, a check system to make sure, you know, there's some redundancy to make sure nobody makes mistakes. And slowly but surely, we'll be able to get the galaxies classified. So you can actually become part of the scientific process by doing this if you want to go to Galaxy Zoo and take that little, literally, it's like a five minute uh, training session, uh, but it will help you obviously with this chapter because one of the things is being able to classify galaxies. But when you do that also, we've had uh, people with no astronomy background discover things that no one's ever seen before and get things named after them. So that's really awesome. So anyways, I definitely recommend you check that out. There are hundreds of billions of galaxies and obviously to go and classify them as a, as a Herculean task, if you will, as I say, staring at my chihuahua named Hercules. So I don't know why this is not letting me move my photo. So anyways, this is a typical photo of like the Hubble deep field. And in fact, this one, you get to see some stuff you normally don't get to see. Y'all see all these little arcs? This is gravitational lensing as predicted by Einstein's general theory of relativity. Basically that first observation that Sir Arthur Eddington made uh, that you know, made Einstein famous, not only to the scientific community, but actually made him famous to the uh, rest of the world was this very type of effect. So basically stars or galaxies in the background will have their light deflected to a different angle because of mass in the foreground. So what you're seeing here is little bands of light where there's maybe a star right here and it's trying to shine off this way, but because it gets in the well that is, you know, sort of that trampoline with a bowling ball on it, it hits that arc on the bowling ball and then curves back to us and we end up seeing this arc. This could be all, for instance, from one star, or all from one galaxy, as could this one and so on and so forth. So that's really cool. Yeah, and here is the Harlow, Shapley, and Curtis debate, uh, Abair Curtis. So yeah, that's the Curtis debate. That was the 1920s. So yeah, that puts Edwin Hubble in the 1920s then as opposed to 1915. Uh, so that big debate was, were these nebulas actual galaxies or were they just, uh, you know, it, what they call islands of stars or were they just clouds of gas and dust? And that's literally what, why they were named nebula. Nebula means something that's not clear, sort of cloudy or whatever. And that's what, uh, uh, 
uh, Andromeda was called. It was called the Great Andromeda Nebula or the Andromeda Nebula as opposed to the Andromeda Galaxy until Hubble came along. And what Hubble did was Hubble saw a uh, Cepheid variable star in it. And he used that Cepheid variable star and, and data that wasn't that good at the time to estimate how far away the galaxy was. And the galaxy was so far away that he knew it couldn't be part of us. It had to, in fact, be a, a separate island of stars. And that's why the, the Shapley-Curtis debate uh, you know, became irrelevant at that point, or moot, as they would call it. Moot means academic, uh, not a worthy question anymore. And that's specifically because he discovered that definitively this had to be a galaxy. And what's worse is it was definitively discerned to be a galaxy, even though he got the distance way too wrong. Like the distance was only on the order of 100,000 light years. Uh, and the, the distance actually turns out to be about 2.5 million. And because of that error, uh, and I wouldn't say it's his error because, you know, he was using data that wasn't that good. Uh, so it was really a problem with the data and the technology of the time. But because of that, that allowed another idea co to come into uh, favor with the universe, specifically the steady state model that you learned about in the Beyond the Big Bang. So people already knew that the universe was older than 100,000 years old by the 1920s. And he actually got this when you actually, uh, when he did all the galaxies, he put them in a plot of distance versus velocity. And what he found is the farther away they were, the faster they were running away from us. And for instance, if you found one that was 100 megaparsecs away and it was moving at 100 meters per second, if you found one 200 megaparsecs away, it would be moving away from us at 200 meters per second. And if you found one 300 megaparsecs away, it'd be moving away at 300 meters per second. Uh, that was what he found. That was the proof of the expansion of the universe. Uh, not that the galaxies were moving in the universe, but the universe was expanding. And if you trace that line back where they're all uh, close to each other, in other words, they're all in the same location, you find that the, gal the uh, universe would be on the order of a couple hundred thousand years old. Uh, but that's because, like, again, all his distances were off because his data on the Cepheid variables was not very good. And that allowed this, the solid state, or excuse me, the uh, static uh, model of the universe uh, to basically sort of wedge itself into the debate. And then later, uh, we, we actually got, because we found the microwave uh, mi microwave background radiation, that put it into that debate as well. So there's a lot of cool history in this, but all of this started uh, with Hubble, which actually, to be honest with you, it started with Alex Friedman, uh, who was Alexander Friedman, who was a, uh, a Russian physicist who took Einstein's equations, uh, just like uh, just like Lemaitre, George Lemaitre did, and found that the universe was expanding based on Einstein's general theory of relativity. And they all predicted that. And then Hubble comes along and shows that it's true. Uh, and that basically is the origins of the idea of the Big Bang. It wasn't something, in the case of Lemaitre, as you can tell, since he was a Jesuit priest, it wasn't something where we were trying to, you know, uh, say God doesn't exist or anything crazy like that. It was just the science made it, uh, made us not be able to conclude anything else because the only time you can see something moving away from you twice as fast when it's twice as far away is when the thing that it's in is actually expanding sort of like uh, raisins in a raisin bread as the raisin bread rises. Uh, so that's kind of neat and that's, you know, how all this came to be. So the debate, as I said, was inconclusive. It's sort of, you know, like almost all debates, you've got a bunch of proponents, people that support one side or the other. And more or less, most of the people that leave, leave with the exact same opinion they came in with, uh, with a little bit of changing minds along the edges. And that's pretty much what happened. But like I said, later when Edwin Hubble observed that the Andromeda galaxy was an, a separate island of stars and then catalog, you know, dozens of galaxies and found that the, when they're twice as far away, they go twice as fast, four times as far away goes four times as fast, so on and so forth. That was a big deal. So here is the Andromeda galaxy. And you can see, for instance, uh, when you see a bright spot like this, this is what a supernova would look like inside of the galaxy. And you can see here in this particular case, here's its appearance on December uh, 17th. 
then 21st, then 30th, then 26th. This is an actual CFIAD variable. Uh, I was selling you this uh, just to let you know that's what when I was saw M101 uh, with a supernova in it. It was like this. It was actually maybe even a little brighter. Like it, 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 it obscured all the galaxy behind it for about an area this big. Uh, but in this case, if you find just a single star, uh, CFIAD variable in this case, and you look at it and it looks a certain brightness. Remember, brightness is reflected by the bigness of the dot, okay? So this is a decent sized dot. It got really small, then it got bigger, and then it got even bigger still. If you make a plot of that brightness as a function of time, it'll look like a sine wave like this. And then you find uh, the time period from the peak to another peak. And that gives you a, a number that you can throw into a formula and when you have that one, that formula gives you the actual mass. So uh, that's really what the what the the brightness versus period versus mass relationship is. And that's what he was using to locate uh, and tell how far away Andromeda was. Again, his data was not that good because we had just discovered this. Our uh, Henrietta Swan Levitt had just discovered this, and it was a it's a major a uh, wonderful thing for science that she had discovered it, but like I said, the data was kind of crappy, so she they got it a little wrong. Uh, the distance was greater than the size of the Milky Way, so galaxies must be island universes uh, separate from the Milky Way. Uh, when you see a galaxy, just like if you took a snapshot of a bunch of coins you threw up in the air, you're not guaranteed to always see it face on, like, you know, this, this is another candidate that I would say is like the Pinball Galaxy. Are you know even edge on? Uh, in fact, you're going to see it in all sorts of positions. So when you look at a galaxy, you got to remember you might be looking at an edge on uh, a quarter angle or three quarters angle or face on. Okay, so galaxies throughout the universe are in all orientations, so we can figure out that there are three major shapes of galaxies. The shapes are spiral, which is like this, this. Uh, possibly this is really hard to tell, but more than like, and, and I should say it's, it's hard to tell, but I'll explain to you why it's easy to tell. Uh, same thing with this one. This one's hard to tell, but it's also easy to tell. The other one is elliptical, and then the last one is irregular. And irregular is like somebody just sneezed and got a booger on the sheet. So if you, if you see a booger, it's probably irregular. Uh, if it don't have that, that cross mark that makes it like a little star or whatever, uh, then, then it's going to be a galaxy. And if it's shaped like a booger or snot wad or sneeze or spit or whatever, then, then you're probably looking at a regular. Uh, spirals do look spiral. They look like the shape of footballs and uh, basketballs and stuff like that. But galaxies are classified based on their appearance. The one thing that I got to let you know uh, that helps me figure out these galaxies is spiral galaxies uh, have a rotating disk of gas and dust. Okay, so that's why I can tell when I see this, this is like looking at the Milky Way. When I look at the Milky Way, I see little spots of darkness and brightness all around. That's the cloud of gas and dust, uh, and it's all in one plane. So that tells me it's a disk of gas and dust. It tells me I'm in that disk of gas and dust, and that that is more than likely a spiral galaxy. Same thing here, I see a, a disk of gas and dust. The other thing is the disk must be, of course, rotating. That's the nature of how it came into being. And then there will also be sparred, uh, or excuse me, sparred. There will be spiral arms, but there might even be barred spiral arms, which is where I came up with the word sparred. <laughs> okay. So spiral galaxies are flattened and thin. They can look round if viewed from face on and flat if viewed edge on. Uh, like I said, they have a rotating disk of gas and dust. That's a good indicator. Uh, and actually, to tell that our galaxy is a spiral galaxy, it took more than that, that Milky Way image that we saw, and it took more than us realizing those are part of us and the Andromeda galaxy is not. It took us mapping uh, O and B stars. So we found maps of O and B stars. Like if you actually plot the distances of O and B stars, you would find they fill out a shape like this, like a, a spiral arm. And then if you map using the 21 centimeter line uh, for neutral hydrogen, that's literally when the electron flips from spin up to spin down in the neutral hydrogen atom, uh, you will find cold neutral hydrogen. And that also forms a spiral arm as well. So you see star 
potentially star birthing areas by the 21 centimeter line. And then you see uh, actual star creation, O and B stars in a spiral as well. All those things came together to for us to conclusively reach or for us to reach the conclusion that our galaxy was a spiral. Some galaxies called elliptical galaxies are oval shaped from any angle. They usually don't have a cloud of gas and dust. They don't have a disk. And in fact, their, their gas is mostly hot gas. Uh, if they have any uh, rotating disk of gas and dust, it's normally near the very center. And it would only be as a result of the innermost stars. And it doesn't matter anyways, because you wouldn't be able to see it because of the brightness of the stars that are surrounding it. So uh, if you see a, a, you know, something comparable in size to the entire galaxy of gas and dust in a disk, it's probably going to be a spiral galaxy. Uh, but if you see no gas and dust disk, no rotating disk, then chances are, unless it's oddly shaped, it's going to be an elliptical galaxy. Galaxies that are neither uh, tight are called irregular galaxies. Of course, then you have subclassifications as well. So you have the elliptical galaxy, and it starts with an E, so you classify it as an E galaxy. Uh, if it looks nearly spherical, you call it an E0. As it gets more and more flattened, you would call it an E3 or E5 or E7. When you look at a spiral galaxy, you can have a uh, spiral galaxy with no arms, which is what SA, SB, and SCR, or you can have it with bars and then it's SBA or SBB or SBC, okay? And I think you can tell uh, this one looks like, uh, just like this one, like the spiral arms are sort of really hard to distinguish the individual separate ones. Uh, whereas as you get further and further to the right, as you become SA, SB and SC, it actually looks like they're uh, more, more easy to identify the individual spiral arms. Our galaxy sort of looks like, as best we can tell, sort of a mixture between this one, meaning we think it has uh, copious or a lot of uh, spiral arms, but it's a barred spiral. So it'd be more like this, uh, but with a lot more spiral arms on it. That's what we think our galaxy currently is. So the spirals have spiral arms that line the flattened disk in a central bulge that extends above and below the disk. So that's the other part you want to look for. But notice that is not something that differentiates from the galaxy. There's a, there's a central bulge in the elliptical galaxies as well, right? So you can't use that to differentiate between a spiral and a elliptical. But it is a fact. Spirals have uh, spiral arms and a central bulge. They have a spherical component and a flat or a disk component. That's, that's the way we look at it. There are two types of spirals, the regular and the barred. Spirals are classified by how bright the central bulge is. So again, if you look here, uh, this central bulge looks like a, a considerably brighter than that central bulge. Oh, crap. Uh, OK. So I'm getting a phone call and my watch is shaking. Anyways, uh, spirals are classified by how central the bulge is and how tightly wound the arms are. SA and SBA are bright centers with tight arms. So that's what I was telling you about not being able to see the individual arms because they're so tight in the SA and SBA. And then the, these, the central bulge is not that bright and they're loosely wrapped so you can see and count the individual spirals. And uh, SC and SBC are dim center with open arms, okay? These are the light curves, how light falls off with distance from the galaxy. Uh, and these are the predicted velocity that you expect from Kepler's third law. Uh, here's the predicted density of, of stars. And that seems to match the light pretty well, but it doesn't match the observed velocity, the velocity, instead of continuing to fall down, it actually levels off. And this is where we start to have to conclude that there must exist dark matter, okay? Because uh, if, if there wasn't any extra matter, and this matter, by the way, must be spherically 
oriented around the entire galaxy. If there wasn't for that, then the curve should look exactly like this because the farther you go out, there's less mass inside of your orbit to pull you in. So you actually uh, have a lower velocity the farther and farther you get, just like uh, the velocity of Uranus is way lower than the velocity of Mercury, okay? So the same thing's going on here, but lo and behold, it starts to fall off like you expect, and then it levels off, which means there must be a lot more mass around. So that's our first introduction to, oh crap, there must be dark matter, okay? Ellipticals are classified by how elliptical they are. S0 galaxies be, uh, appear to be a cross between S and E with uh, a disc with no arms. So you can see, notice how this, this gas is really, or this whatever this is, it really looks kind of hot it, and it doesn't look cloudy or dusty. So it's, it's, that's really one of the hallmarks of the elliptical galaxy. The irregulars have no defined shape. Uh, this, for instance, uh, looks sort of like a blob of nothingness. And you might even suspect, oh, maybe the irregulars happen after collisions because you see how jacked up these things looked while they're being collided. So this was clearly a beautiful spiral galaxy, but now it's like two blobs of crap, right? And uh, so it's not unreasonable to think maybe these irregulars come from collisions with other galaxies and, and uh, that seems to be the case. Two blobs uh, start, of crap? <laughs> yeah, wads of crap. <laughs> is, that a, is that a scientific term? It's a te technical term, yes. That and uh -oh. buttload. <laughs> so stars and gas in the galaxy orbit an overall gravitational field. This is elliptical galaxies now. So there's not a rotating disk like we had in the spiral case. Uh, these are sort of random motions, right? So we don't expect any net uh, wrote, I mean, if you did the statistics, obviously there would be a net rotation axis, but the deal is this is completely random uh, motion. Well, I say completely. It's, it, this is motion that's obeying only gravity and doesn't have any rhyme or reason where the, all of them are trying to slowly transform into a spiral disk. That's not what's going on here. So the stars in the elliptical galaxies orbit in many different directions, uh, maintaining the elliptical shape. Uh, of course, they don't have as much matter, you know, if you had, for instance, like a, a spiral galaxy, like a nebula cloud when it's forming a, a star system, you don't have all that matter in one plane that tends to slow it down and dampen out the motion. So this stuff's just going to continue. Spiral galaxies have a thin disk. It, it orbits are circular and all are nearly in the same direction. Uh, the stars in the bulge of, of a spiral galaxy have orbits in many directions as an elliptical galaxy. So inside the bulge, you have more like an elliptical galaxy. And that's what I was trying to tell you about what an uh, elliptical galaxy is, is they're going in random directions. And you might even have properties of a spiral galaxy inside of that, that core. Uh, but again, it's so bright in the core of the spiral that, I mean, of the uh, elliptical that you wouldn't even notice it. So this is one of the coolest galaxies. I want to say this one's a Sombrero galaxy, uh, but look how beautifully flat that disk is. And they don't have to be, by the way. I've seen pretty ones like this. In fact, uh, Apple has a screensaver that's a beautiful picture, I think, from Hubble of a galaxy like this, but the galaxy is not flat. It's a, it's a galaxy like this, but like this end is drooping down and this end is drooping up because it's being... Uh, in the process of colliding with another galaxy. So it's really some cool images you see, but gas in ellipticals is mostly hot, but gas in spirals is mostly cold. Uh, cold gas can uh, form into molecular clouds out of which stars form. So that's what I was talking about, the 21 centimeter line. New stars are coming in spiral galaxies. Uh, that's where you plot out the uh, O and B stars, and you actually look for, in addition to the O and B stars, stars you look for ionized hydrogen. Uh, that's another characteristic of the clouds uh, where these new stars are being born, and it would be ionized specifically because the new stars are causing it. Uh, no star formation occurs in elliptical galaxies, so uh, since there, since no stars are forming, that means uh, unless it was only recently formed, then you wouldn't have uh, really bright uh, O and B stars. So in fact, they would mostly be reddishes and yellows and oranges and stuff like that. Uh, so when you see them as a bright white and blue, that's probably a temporary state where they were still producing uh, massive stars, uh, but they're 
essentially no longer making stars, so they'll slowly turn yellow and reddish. Uh, there is very little dust in elliptical galaxies, as you can tell when you see that. It's more like this material that you see above and below this uh, spiral galaxy. That's what the the, ga the quote unquote uh, gas looks like around elliptical galaxies. So there's no real dust like this black line that you see there, that brownish line. Here's the photos we were just looking at, the one that someone thought was a pinwheel possibly, and, and he might actually be right. Uh, there's a whirlpool galaxy that looks a little like this, but it's less barred. Uh, and then there is a pinwheel galaxy that definitely looks like this. So he, he, he might be right. I, like I said, I, I'm not that familiar with all the photos, but uh, stars form in spiral arms where the gas and dust are concentrated. The clouds are compressed in the arms. We know from the blue color where star formation occurs since blue light comes only from young stars. So hot O and B stars produce light and ionized uh, H2 regions. So H1 is uh, the first ionization state and H2 is the second ionization state. So size difference is not important. There are a wide range of size in each galaxy type. An elliptical galaxy can be a dwarf galaxy or a giant galaxy. All spirals are giants though. So the largest galaxies are several thousand times more massive than the smallest. And surprisingly, differences in mass do not lead to obvious differences in the galaxies. We'll learn slowly the process that we go by uh, and, and, and what we think forms galaxies. And, and that's a little bit now as well as uh, you'll continue it more in the next chapter. So how do we find these distances? This is the distance ladder and this is one of the single most important diagrams in your textbook uh, just because it gives you the ways we go from one measuring technique to the next. So within our solar system, for instance, we can measure distances to the nearest uh, uh, using radar. We can measure distances to various uh, uh, planets, but that's about it. Once we find that distance mechanism, we can use that and then uh, where it overlaps, we can use it to confirm our method of trigonometry, which is basically uh, parallax. So parallax can get us on the order of 10 to the third to 10 to the fourth parsecs, uh, whereas the radar can only get us to about 10 to the negative third parsecs, so just within our galaxy. Uh, Beyond that, you can then take the overlap between the parsec and spectral, uh, spectroscopic parallax, and you can actually see that spectroscopic parallax will get us from 1,000 parsecs or even uh, 10, to the, 10 to the second uh, parsecs on up to about 10 to the sixth. Beyond that, we get to about a million parsecs, and that's the CIFIA variables uh, like Hubble use. And that again has an overlap with the next step. So we can use type 1a supernovas to get that. And then ultimately we can use Hubble's law when we're dealing with galaxies and things in galaxies. Uh, so Hubble's law one, basically what was noticed was the galaxies are all red shifted, meaning they're leaving us. And they're red shifted by a very specific amount that gives you a velocity. Once you use a CFIAD variable or some other method to find out how far away they are, then you can uh, make a plot of distance versus uh, velocity and you get this straight line and that's where Hubble's law came in. This is actually Hubble's plot from the 1920s. Uh, that constant, in fact, you can invert that and convert units and that'll give you the age of the universe, which turns out to be about 13.8 uh, billion years. So that's pretty impressive. Uh, as I told you earlier, the rotation curves for the matter does show us that there's a, a buttload of matter outside of the uh, matter that we see, and that's what we call dark matter. The other matter uh, is called baryonic matter or luminous matter, and uh, we estimate that that's probably 2% of the universe is what we know about, and the other 98% is dark matter and dark energy, and we haven't even learned about dark energy yet, so this is only dark matter, which is, I think, roughly 60%. Uh, we found other evidence. For instance, we can see dark areas where galaxies are being uh, drawn towards. We can see dark areas where gravitational lensing is occurring. Uh, the hypotheses for what these could be are things like WIMPs, which are weakly interacting massive particles, or machos, which are massive compact halo objects. Uh, and finally, we can find out that there are quasars, and quasars are bright radio sources with very faint blue optical counterparts. So you can see the H delta line, the H gamma line, the H beta, and the H alpha. 
Uh, when first measured, the spectra were so strange that it was not clear what these objects were. Finally, Martin, Martin Schmidt recognized the spectral lines as highly redshifted emission lines. Uh, we think these actually could come from uh, black hole interactions. So redshifts might uh, uh, mean that these objects are extremely far away and must be extremely extraordinarily luminous. There are trillions times brighter than the sun. Quasars are found at great distances. And they're part of the actic galactic nuclei. Uh, so in other words, the, we think the big uh, galaxies have supermassive black holes in them and, and sometimes the quasars could be coming from those. Other types of active galactic nuclei, nuclei are Seifert galaxies and radio galaxies, and you can see the lights from those. Uh, so that's basically it. Uh, I will let you guys finish this off. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and call it a day. Uh, you can read these slides, of course, the process of science is where we're done, but the supermassive black holes are at the core of each of them. Uh, Again, the active galactic nuclei, nuclei could come from the supermassive black holes. They could come from quasars. It could be that quasars come from supermassive black holes. Uh, of course, there's blazars, which you can read about, and stuff of that sort. Uh, but the big thing about these is they're very small, and, and the astronomers have this rule that basically anything uh, whose signal changes in a small amount of time, if you multiply that small amount of time times the speed of light, that's the absolute biggest the thing can be. So that's how we figured out that these things are small. I'm going to go ahead and call it. I've uh, got to go take care of some stuff, which you can hear my dog uh, making a fuss from. But I enjoyed having you, and I will see you guys at 1 o'clock. Our lab's going to be very short. I've already got it planned out for you. So I will see you all at 1, and you are free to go. Anybody have any questions before they split? You're welcome to stick around. I have one thing to say. If Never Blob heard. of Crap is not on a multiple choice question i have not seen what a crap or a I, I will be vaguely probably. disappointed you will crush every every ounce of joy inside me <laughs> I, I will look i will look into my test banks and make sure i've got that updated yeah, that that right. has got to be in there it's a scientific term <laughs> it's, it is, Blob it of is crap. now anyways <laughs> <laughs> i will go with all of you have one. a question on <laughs> Uh, yes, I had a question, Professor. Okay. I, um, I'm trying to pull up the email now, but I emailed you uh, sometime this weekend, and I was just kind of talking about how I was confused about, um, one second, I'm trying to pull up the lab now so I can think about exactly what I said. Oh, it was about the winter cycle lab. And okay. um, in the beginning, it says for the first procedure, we need to um, 